perhaps that's because we're in engineering. Um, so my name's Danny Kingsley. Questions people have trouble asking, answering are, what tools are available for me to use? Where can I find those tools? Where can I find the documentation? How do I adjust them for my purpose? And who can I ask for help if I need it? So the complexity of this landscape does make it difficult. It's quite a high area barrier to entry for some people. And challenge number five, everyone's favorite, the law. So laws that are relevant to text and data mining. First of all, you've got the intellectual property laws, copyright, and in Europe, the sui generis database law, which essentially functions like a copyright kind of protection for anyone who puts time and effort into creating a database. And data protection law is a third law that protects any kind of personal data that might be used to identify a human being. In terms of the actual text and data mining process, um, when you're identifying and retrieving content, you're usually making local copies of content. This is a copy under copyright law. This is restricted. Preparing content for analysis, you might be extracting the content into a new form. You might be making an XML annotated form. This is, again, a copy. can be considered copyright restricted. Using the TDM process itself, you're probably loading the content into the computer's memory, which, again, some people will consider making a copy. And finally, of course, disseminating the results, you might want to publish small excerpts. So copyright can actually become an issue in all stages of the TDM process. Now, you may have heard of the copyright exception for text and data mining in the UK, which is a great step forward. It's a really positive thing. But there are some issues with this in terms of the actual practical applicability of it, which are that in terms of who can benefit. Now, this copyright exception specifically says it must be TDM for non-commercial purposes. And the problem with copyright law is that it's essentially defined by case law. And we don't have any cases at the moment about text and data mining and what is considered commercial or non-commercial. If you're at a university and you're collaborating with or funded by an industrial partner, to what extent is that commercial? And at what point does it then become not allowable under the exception? Nobody wants to be the first case and find out, right? So this actually has quite a chilling effect on some applications of text and data mining, especially in research industry and in publicly funded research where we really do have to make sure that we're completely compliant with the law. Um, there are other limitations in the law, such as there's a provision for reasonable technological protection measures. This is so that people who own content can, for example, put a rate limit on how fast you can download their content to protect their servers, which is a reasonable, a reasonable expectation. But there's no clear definition of what reasonable is and what sort of rate limits should apply. And so at the moment, there are, I mean, we run into issues with people having trouble downloading data sets big enough to use. And of course, there are issues with international collaborations. I mean, I'm sure everyone in this room has worked with someone from another country at some point. And if you're in a research group, you're collaborating with someone elsewhere in Europe, then what happens if they don't have a copyright exception for text and data mining? So licensing is one way to ensure that you're operating within the law, but there are some limitations of licensing content for text and data mining as well. So because TDM requires such large data sets to really get the value out of it, often from so many different sources, actually get doing the rights clearance and obtaining licenses from all those sources can become prohibitively time consuming, especially for researchers. And we had one comment from a stakeholder we talked to who says, I mean, I can't justify funding a PhD student just to do the rights clearance and talk to the license holders. So, which is about how much time he estimated it would take. Uh, many existing licenses are unclear on text and data mining. So unless you can be sure that the exception applies to your case, you may not know whether the license explicitly permits text and data mining. And in the strictest interpretation of the law, unless it's explicitly permitted, you have to assume that it's protected. Um, and in some cases, then, licensing is just impossible. If you want to do text and data mining analysis of a million different web pages, it's just not possible to contact all of the web page owners and to get their permission to use their web pages for various, um, for various purposes. So there are a lot of really useful or potentially very useful text and data mining use cases where rights clearance is just not a possibility. Data protection, you may have heard of a GDPR that comes into effect this next year. I won't go into all the details, but essentially personal data is anything that can be used to identify a living person. So if you're working with any data that has even someone's IP address, this is going to be considered personal data and then is um, restricted by different laws around the general data protection regulation. Uh, greater restrictions apply to any sort of sensitive data like political opinions, biometric data. But the really important thing to remember for text and data mining is that combining data sets 
can accidentally de-anonymize data. So if you have one data set about one kind of information about a group of people, another data set about the same group of people which has a different kind of information, you put those two together, in some cases you can then identify the people that are in that group, even though both sets of data were anonymized in and of themselves. Sometimes by linking data together, you can then connect them enough to find individual people. So this is a risk when you start accessing lots of different data sources for a TDM project. Right, so yeah, to recap, um, the main challenges for TDM users, if you're actually wanting to do text and data mining for research, identifying the content, retrieving the content, getting it into a usable form, the actual process themselves can be complex, and then finally, the legal landscape can be unclear. So, this has all so far been about what the actual TDM users want to do with text and data mining. And Project's also been looking at some of the broader challenges in the TDM landscape, which aren't necessarily specifically related to the people carrying out text and data mining. And I won't go into these in a lot of detail here, but you can find the full report on our website. But essentially, we've split them into four areas. In the technical and infrastructure areas, we have lots of silos of information that are uninteroperable or not easy to connect. So again, if you want to analyze a large, broad amount of data, it makes it quite difficult. Legal issues, which we've just covered, different laws across the EU, often the national, national laws will interpret EU ideas differently, um, and the complexity of dealing with multiple licenses all become problems. In terms of education skills and awareness, there is poor awareness of TDM and its potential. And we saw how few people in the room felt like they really understand what TDM is. Um, and yeah, there's little sharing of knowledge and best practices across domains. So we find that a lot of individual groups of people are starting to do text and data mining, but they're often not talking to each other and sharing best practices and learning things from each other. And of course, lack of ex access to TDM experts, um, sometimes just because they're prohibitively expensive to hire. But um, yeah, and finally, economic incentives. We find there's sometimes gaps in funding. So researchers will say, it's easy to get funding to develop a new TDM technology, but if I want to scale it or you know, do something broader with it, they say, well, that's an industrial application. That's no longer novel research. You know, Find someone else to fund that. And then, of course, uncertainty from the return on investment. Um, in the industrial setting, a lot of companies are hesitant to spend a lot of money investing in new technologies unless they can be sure what they're going to get out of it. So coming back to the original purpose of the text and data mining future TDM project, um, it's not all bad. We have actually been looking at ways to increase the uptake of text and data mining in Europe. And the main thing that we're about to promote, um, about to publish, is our roadmap for increasing text and data mining across the EU. So this is really the culmination of everything we found and what we think the European Commission should be focusing on in terms of up, uh, increasing the uptake of TDM. And we've identified three key phases. The first one is we need more content available. At the moment, there just aren't the really big data sets, well, aren't enough of the really big data sets to really see the benefits of text and data mining. And until we have big data sets available, it doesn't really matter how many people we train up with skills or how much we build awareness, there has to be something to actually operate on. Phase two, support the early adopters. So those people who are already doing text and data mining technology, help them to create support networks, things like the JISC mailing list sounds fantastic, help them to connect with each other, to share learnings, and to help each other develop tools and applications. And then phase three, what we're calling the next generation, not necessarily the next generation literally, but any new people who would like to get involved with text and data mining, trying to increase sort of the pool of potential text and data miners by creating a data savvy society where everybody has some understanding of what can be done with data and why text and data mining can be such a valuable technology. The other thing this project has been putting together is, and which are now available on our website at this address, are uh, some practical guidelines for stakeholders. So we identified four key areas where we thought that the future TDM learnings could really help people um, address challenges in the text and data mining landscape. Uh, I'll just go briefly through these. So the legal guidelines we've put together cover things like what legal considerations are relevant to TDM in a lot more detail, intellectual property if I need a license, we've got a step-by-step -step plan to minimize risk, legal risk, data protection, what needs to be considered, and whether you should seek legal advice. In terms of guidelines for licensing content, and this is one we'd really like to share with libraries and anybody who negotiates licenses on behalf of broader communities of researchers, is when you're negotiating a license, please consider the needs of people who want to do TDM as well as just your typical human researchers. So think about the considerations with respect to text and data mining, like does it make sense to distinguish between commercial and non-commercial research for my researchers? You know, is the usage and activity monitoring going to affect their academic freedoms? Can they reproduce reasonable excerpts of the content they're analyzing? 
Is it practical for them to attribute credit to everything? And are the technical protection measures actually reasonable? The data management, again, so for anyone who's managing a repository or helping with data management plans, again, really thinking about data management in terms of text and data mining and not just human access. So open access does not necessarily mean that content is accessible for TDM. Just putting something in an open repository doesn't mean that a computer can read it and use it and find it. So machine readers really need that machine readable file formats, metadata, and bulk access. And in terms of machine readable metadata, again, anything that would help a researcher to identify a corpus of content they want to work with. And finally, guidelines for supporting text and data mining at universities. So universities are really involved in all aspects of the text and data mining value chain, from creating content with their researchers, disseminating content through publications and repositories, developing and using TDM tools and actual research focused on TDM, and sharing of the new knowledge and insights that come out of the application of text and data mining. But what we found in this project is that very few universities have even started approaching supporting text and data mining in a strategic, high-level policy way. So that's what I'd just like to focus on for these last few slides. So university libraries are really in a unique position to help support text and data mining. Um, we talk to many researchers across Europe, and an awful lot of them think that a university library is going to be their first port of call for support for their research, which makes sense, of course. Uh, libraries are already fulfilling other support roles in terms of helping researchers with things like open access. So when the new technology comes in, researchers see libraries as their support for that as well. Uh, libraries, central libraries are able to coordinate across different university departments. Again, something that many libraries are doing already in other aspects, and this will really help to bring together people who are doing text and data mining in one field or another, and will be able to share learnings. Um, libraries are also often involved in data management plans and helping people with data management, as well as content dissemination via repositories. So having libraries aware of the needs of text and data mining and bulk access to content and data analytics, as well as just individual researchers accessing content, will really help to make sure that the content they're disseminating is as useful as possible for further reuse and as valuable as possible to the research community. And again, libraries may often be involved in negotiations with publishers about licenses, in which case we really do urge you to think about the needs of text and data mining and broader bulk use of content as opposed to just individual researcher access. So we, in the course of the project, came across several steps that you can take as a university or within your university to help encourage your university's decision makers to develop strategic policies around text and data mining. And these are, we go into these in a lot more depth in the guidelines that are again found online. But in terms of demonstrating a need for this sort of thing, uh, Ghent University in Belgium a couple of years ago carried out a survey and a bunch of interviews all across their research and education faculties saying what skills do we need to be focusing on supporting, what are we not currently doing, and one of the major things that came out of this was we need better data management, better data science skills across the board for all of our researchers. So with that evidence they were then able to go back and use it to justify further investigation about how we could develop these new skills, how we can put them into the curriculum, how we can make sure that researchers have these skills for 21st century research. Uh, involving stakeholders is another really key thing. There are a lot of people who have vested interests around the use of big data and how data is shared and reused. So, I mean, researchers, libraries, education research faculty, students, IT, other support services. If you get all of these people talking to each other in a room, trying to make sure that everyone feels like their views are being heard, their needs are being respected, this is a really crucial step to making sure that you have buy-in from the whole community about supporting text and data mining in universities. Uh, understanding your institution. Uh, this is, I mean, obviously people recognize that universities each have their own organizational hierarchies, but again, using Ghent University as an example, they actually went and did a proper investigation into how the different lines of educational topics worked within the university. They looked at how new topics are introduced to education, how different departments react, and then they looked at some of the key core fundamental skills that all researchers were expected to learn across the university. And then they found ways to sort of hang the key skills around data science across some of those core competencies and say, well, look, this is going to be part of this for new research. And in this way, they were able to gradually integrate data science skills and data management skills into the existing curricula by working with the existing system and understanding how it worked. Uh, consolidating information. So again, the role of libraries is a hub within a university and being able to bring together what different people are doing in different areas. 
and different learnings that people have had, just so that you can increase the visibility of these things and you can increase people's ability to communicate with each other. Anything you do to help sort of break down those walls between silos and little research groups doing TDM in different areas. And this is not only in terms of technical skills and TDM processes, but also connecting researchers to, for example, legal advice if they're unsure about what they can do with content and other skills that might be relevant. Identifying promoters and early adopters. Uh, this is something that Cambridge has done with their Data Champions program, which seems really fantastic. Um, they asked for volunteers who are interested in data management from various research groups who came forward and were happy because it's something they're personally interested in to promote this within their faculties and subject areas and to support data management across the university. And you can imagine something similar in terms of text and data mining. If you find the people who are keen to do this already, who are already looking into it, then you know, they'll help you to promote TDM around the university. They'll be keen to get other people involved and to work with each other. So by identifying these early adopters, you can find a bottom-up approach to trying to spread the news about TDM and support for TDM. And the other key thing here is that self-identified promoters bring domain expertise. So this is another issue we identified was that there's sometimes a gap between, for example, a historian who knows what sorts of questions are important and interesting in their field and a, a computer specialist who knows how to apply text and data mining to you know, books and text. So in terms of those sorts of people connecting, communicating, understanding each other's needs and making sure that they're really answering the interesting questions. Um, this is where self-identified promoters from a specific field can become really useful. In terms of incentives for supporting text and data mining, I mean, of course, funding is a great incentive, but if this isn't available, funding is not the only thing that motivates researchers. I know that a lot of us care about things like recognition, whether that be on the university website or within our own departments or in a broader sense. So offering researchers recognition for helping out and being involved in text and data mining um, is a fantastic way to promote it within your institution. And at University College London, they've actually got a group of PhD students who are working on creating curricula for a pre-university level, sort of at an A-level, uh, sort of high school students level, to help them with some of the fundamentals of data science. And these PhD students were quite happy to work on this as a public good, as volunteers. They thought it was an interesting project. They thought it was important to get more people learning about data science at an earlier age. So they were very happy to be involved. And of course, sharing your progress. So the thing that came out again and again and again in this project was we need more success stories. We need more examples of people doing exciting things with text and data mining. Uh, so if you have been doing an interesting project, please tell your peers about it, tell your friends about it, tell symposiums like this about it, join the GIST mailing list and tell them about it. And um, even small pilot projects are really useful to show people the potential of what can be done and to show that there's an interest out there and to get the momentum rolling. And of course, the Future TDM project website is always happy to share stories on our blog, or we also put together two-page awareness sheets. There's one here we had with the University of Edinburgh where they're using TDM to identify the top most interesting papers within a field to help their researchers save time and effort in their work. Uh, yeah, so to summarize, TDM is really useful because it helps us deal with the massive deluge of data that we're all subjected to. Especially in research science, there's just so much going on. We need these computer algorithms and techniques to really keep track of what's happening in different areas. Um, that said, content access and reuse, there are different needs with respect to TDM than there are with respect to individual human researchers when they want to access and uh, manipulate content. Uh, the content really needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, an acronym you may have heard of, FAIR data. This is really important for text and data mining. Um, the TDM landscape is complex. There are many tools, many of which you will hear about today. And so this can make it difficult for people to find the right one, which is where really consolidating information and networking is important. Uh, the lawfulness of TDM activities can still be uncertain. So again, researchers should be aware of what legal considerations there are and when to seek expert advice. And finally, that universities and libraries are really uniquely placed to help support TDM. So if you think this is interesting and important, please, again, promote it within your university, promote it within your institution, really try and get the ball rolling on developing strategic policy around supporting text and data mining, because this is going to be a massive part of how we can really realize the benefits of big data analysis. Um, yeah, and that's all from me. So thank you very much for listening. Um, do you have any questions? Oh, yep. I will run around with the mic.
Uh, hello, Kira. It uh, was a very wonderful presentation. Thank you. I'm Marta um, from the, on the transition from biochemistry to work with research data management. I'm very interested, actually, how, how can you, uh, or if you can recommend any place, how we can find these tools? Because you mentioned during the talk that there are tools and how to find them. So do you have a recommendation? Thank you. Right, so I would say that this is really the remit of our sister project, Open Minted. They've been doing some great work at sort of um, getting tools together, sort of building them into interoperable modules so that you can then apply them to various applications. Um, but yeah, so I would start with Open Minted. Um, I think Peter is here from that project, if he has some recommendations. Oh, we've got a comment behind. Oh, and sorry, and John. Yeah. Um, yeah, so at the moment there aren't really any centralized databases of all of the tools available and which is why we really encourage people to talk to each other and develop networks around the sharing of tools and I think a day like today would be really useful to get an idea of what tools are out there and what things people are using but if you're interested in doing a kind of text and data mining what you want ideally want to do is find people working in similar areas ask what they've done find out what you can learn from their best practices because at the moment we don't really have a centralized source of information about text and data mining tools unfortunately Uh, Peter Murray Rust, Content Mine. Um, uh, so I want to pick up this thing about um, uh, uh, the things you mentioned in the talk. Very good talk, by the way. But people here will get the impression that this is both complex and frightening. In other words, the best thing is not to do it right. And I think we've got to challenge that view. I think the British government, having passed the law, has sat back and done nothing. Uh, the universities have done nothing, the funders have done nothing, uh, and we've had three years of flack from uh, the major publishers who've tried to stop us doing it. So we're at crisis point. Uh, in Content Mine, which is a non-profit funded by Shuttleworth organization, we've actually built all the tools that you need. So there's a complete infrastructure of tools, but we don't have the resources to distribute them to people. And you will find this across this, that there's a bottom-up creation of tools from people who want to do this, but there's no institutional support for any of these activities, and there's actually uh, this very strong chilling effect from the publishers. And I, it's not just me, there are other people in this room uh, and colleagues of mine who've been switched off by the publishers, and none, no university in the UK has spoken out trying to promote this. So until we tackle this problem, we might as well uh, struggle from the bottom, uh, getting our heads bitten off all the time by the publishers publishers and the universities. I mean, yeah, that's a really good point. And I do think this is why it's so important for universities to be thinking about supporting TDM at a strategic level and understanding the value of it to the research community and, yeah, developing these sorts of policies that will support researchers who want to do TDM, who will take the side of researchers or at least understand the needs of researchers in negotiations with publishers, not just take the side of publishers by default when it comes to access to content, which we have unfortunately seen happen a few times. And yeah, again, I think success stories are another great way to promote TDM and say, look, we've actually managed to do something fantastic here. We've got this great suite of tools. Why aren't you supporting us more? I think, yeah, there is a lot of scope for institutional support of researchers wanting to do this kind of thing. Hi, uh, Kirsten Lamb, Department of Engineering Library. Um, I was wondering if during your research project you encountered people doing TDM but not calling it that, and if so, you, if you had any advice on how to do outreach to people who are doing what we would recognize as, as TDM but are calling it something else, you know, content mining or one of those other terms that you listed on, on one of your early slides. I, mean, I guess we were talking to people who were, well, we were looking for people doing TDM as they identified as such. So I'm not sure we had any who we would specifically say we're doing TDM but not calling it that. But that is a really good point. I mean, and we've talked to people who find the term quite threatening or scary, like text and data mining, what is that? Again, 
who had like eight people in this room who were happy defining it. Where if you say, you know, using computers to analyze content or make it somehow more accessible to people, that would definitely be a good way to do it. So I think there is definitely some sort of marketing to go on there <laughs> around what text and data mining is and what content anal analysis is and trying to make it more accessible to people who aren't familiar with the terminology that we often use to describe this. I think that's a really good point. Hi, it's Owen Tapping, Lab of Molecular Biology. Um, I was wondering whether there's a lot to talk about challenges, but as somebody who knows very little about text and data mining, um, I was wondering if there's any consideration of um, winning people over to trust the results, if you see what I mean. So to kind of let go of their, what you would see as your human control, so you, you know you test your own results and you've, you've gone through it yourself, to then, do you think that might be a barrier for people thinking, actually, I don't know whether what this, you know, machine readable data has created, whether I can trust that because I can never check it because there are too many sources for me to ever humanly check. Um, and whether that also brings in kind of issues of bias and bias being reinforced um, and maybe magnified beyond a level where a human would when doing research would bring in those sort of checks and balances to, to test that data. So. so, I mean, essentially it's like a black box issue, right? I've got this algorithm that supposedly does all this neat analysis, but I'm not really sure how it works. Can I trust the results of that? Um, yes, that is a problem. Um, we can obviously do things like make sure the algorithms are transparent, but Transparent only means so much if people don't actually have the computer science background to understand what's going on. So there is definitely some issues there where we need to have communication between experts who are designing the algorithms and the people, again, the domain experts who want to apply them to specific outcomes. Um, bias is also a problem. Um, there was a case not too long ago where I think an algorithm was looking at pictures of people and trying to find the most beautiful person as judged by whatever criteria they were using, but it turned out to be incredibly racially biased, like it would always favor white people. Um, which was because of the data sets it was being fed. But again, we have to be careful that we might think the algorithm is neutral, but the data you're feeding to the algorithm might not be neutral and it might then exacerbate biases. So there has to be yeah, a really thorough understanding of what's actually going on under the hood um, in terms of trusting research results from this sort of thing. And I think that can only really come from making sure that we do have communication between the experts working on the algorithms and the people providing the content and analyzing the content and wanting to ask research questions. I'm John McNaught from the National Centre for Text Mining at the University of Manchester. Um, I'd just like to say that um, I'm a member of the Open Minted project, so if you want to find out about tools, firstly you can talk to me and secondly you can go to the Open Minted website, what's going on there. Um, secondly, I'd just like to uh, respond to your point there. I think it's, um, I think most people that work on text mining text and data mining, they, um, they're very keen to ensure that there's a human in the loop, right, in, in whatever way possible, because we know we can't be 100% accurate. That's way beyond us. And so um, the type of projects I get involved in, for example, always have a user-facing aspect in terms of evaluation and so on. So we can, we can be as sure as we can be we're doing the right thing, but even then, if we produce an application, the type of application we would like to produce is one where the user has the final say and is judging what the machine is proposing or suggesting. Okay. Sorry, thanks, John. Um, yeah, I think, again, looking at the case of the rabbits, you use the computer algorithm to analyze the 40,000 records initially. Humans then decide whether or not these were actually cases of the disease. So, again, you've got the human oversight over things like that. It's a really good idea.